and get started. Um, thanks to those joining online, those joining us in person. Uh, our presentation today is one that's intended to help those who are, are thinking about or might want to think about proposing a course to count for the AU core, which is our general education program at American University. Uh, we've got uh, a great team today to, to talk about the different pieces of this process. Um, so we'll start with introducing ourselves and then we'll jump right in. Uh, good morning, I'm Dr. Brown. I'm the AU core assessment analyst. Uh, good morning, I'm Sarah Frungen. Uh, I am the uh, core uh, program coordinator, uh, so I will be the one uh, manning the inbox when you submit your proposals and uh, working with our faculty teams. Okay. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> what All right, hi, everybody. I'm Martin Oliver. I'm the faculty chair of the AU Corps. Um, my home department is the Critical Race, Gender, and Cultural Studies Department. Um, this is my third year in this uh, particular role. If you've got sort of broad curricular questions, I'm 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 going to talk to. And then I'm Brad Knight. I'm the Assistant Dean of Undergraduate Education. Um, I'm, I'm always happy to be working with this team, and the Corps has been a big part of, of my time here at American University. Um, so to get us started, I'm interested in uh, getting a sense of, for those who are, are participating, um, uh, what is the sort of level of comfort that you have with the AU core, your level of familiarity? How do you sort of self-assess your, your knowledge of it? Uh, low, high, somewhere in between? Low. Low, okay. How about those online? Feel free to either type in the chat or unmute and, and let us know. And I think the idea is since we're sort of a smaller group, we can really uh, <clears throat> modify this to best serve the needs of, of, of all of you and make sure we're providing you the kinds of information and help that uh, will be most valuable. Uh, and from the chat, uh, Kelly Jones says, recently became familiar, but fairly familiar now that I've just designed a habit of mind course. Uh, and Augustine Dura says low. Great. So we'll start then with uh, a bit of an overview of the core to, to at least refresh, um, but hopefully deepen some of your knowledge and comfort with, with the core um, before we go into then what are the elements of a proposal and give you some advice from uh, Martin's own experience proposing courses and from our, our team's experience working with faculty and with our committees in, in getting those proposals over the finish line. Um, so the AU core curriculum was implemented first in 2018, and so it's a relatively young curriculum, replaced a, a program that had been in place since 1989 uh, with little change, and the old curriculum reflected the world as it was in, in the late 80s, early 90s. It was a very content-forward program that uh, still occupied that, that mindset that a general education program was intended to create a well-learned person and once you had sort of like ticked off a few boxes you uh, you sort of amassed that that knowledge that you needed and you were all set um, from a student's perspective it was a program that uh, you wanted to get done with fast so you could get on to the fun stuff in your major but now when we look at the world today the needs of our students are different uh, the kinds of uh, challenges that they're going to face in their in their careers and their lives are fundamentally different. Um, if you think about the information explosion, it would no longer be adequate to say that a student just needs uh, an art class, a science class, and that at the end of the day that represents the, the sort of range of knowledge that a person needs. So instead, what we foreground in the core curriculum is inquiry. We want to prepare students to uh, engage with information, to understand the kinds of questions they should be asking about it, to have the tools and skills to, to work with that information, and to recognize how complicated and complex these issues are um, and how frequently they defy uh, simple answers. Um, and so what we have arrived at is a curriculum that stretches across the four years. So it's no longer uh, sort of pushed up to the front. 
um, and it's one that is uh, sort of working with and in conjunction with the major. So it starts with a set of foundations courses that are typically taken in the major and the first, or typically taken in the first year, sorry. Uh, students then progress on into their habits of mind courses that are taken any time in their degree. And then finally, uh, and this is where we see that overlap with the major, there are these integrated courses, which are echoes of those foundation courses. Um, all told, the curriculum you can see the credit values on the slides here represents just a fraction of what a student will do in their degree. A typical degree at American University is about 120 credit hours. So a student has plenty of time in this program to, to take that second major, to take that internship, to study abroad, to, to find the ways that all of those different experiences that really make their AU experience the one that they're in search of possible. Mark, do you want to talk a little bit about the curriculum in a bit more depth? Yeah, so um, we've got it sort of broken up here into a little bit more specificity. You can see in the, uh, the foundations courses, which again are typically taken in the first year by students. Um, we've got uh, AUX or AU Experience 1 and 2, which are uh, smaller, uh, originally uh, designed to be one and a half credits each. Um, students, um, a traditional student would take uh, AUX 1 in the, in the fall and then AUX 2 in the spring. And, those are courses that are designed to sort of like help orient you not just to um, uh, what does it mean to like be at college, but also what are the sorts of ways of thinking and inquiry uh, that could set you up for the rest of your career. But they are sort of smaller uh, and in many ways nuts and bolts kinds of questions or kinds of courses. Um, you also have, and I'll skip to the bottom of the list here, your quantitative literacy one and uh, written, uh, written communication and information literacy one. Uh, those are the sort of uh, first year writing, first year math kinds of courses, but uh, of course are foundational and are very important. In the middle here, and I think is in many ways the kind of jewel of the program, uh, is what we call complex problems. Uh, these are courses, they're a first year uh, seminar course taught by full time faculty. And the idea of these courses is that they engage with a question or a problem or a, a theme that has no simple solution, that has uh, that raises problems that can't be solved by any specific singular uh, methodological or intellectual approach, but really requires a whole a vast array of inquiry and problem solving in order to, to, to deal with in any way adequately. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the proposal process for that. We are always welcoming uh, new proposals for complex problems. Uh, we'll see in a second the, the uh, real diversity of kinds of courses that are offered in that, uh, in that program. In the middle here are the habits of mind courses. And they might look a little bit like this is that sort of like distribution requirement, which is the, uh, the way that the old general education program uh, function. But I, I would suggest that this functions in a really different way. So first of all, these uh, courses, Habits of Mind, occur across the curriculum from 100 level all the way up to 400 level courses, right? So students can uh, encounter them at any point during their time here at AU. Uh, we, we really hope that students aren't just like cramming them all into their first you know, three semesters or something like this, but instead they kind of space them out over their uh, time at AU. Second, and you noted by the, the <clears throat> repetition of the word inquiry here, um, it, it's not designed, these courses aren't designed to des deliver specific content, but rather to emphasize ways of thinking about the world. Um, and so we want to give uh, students an opportunity to engage with questions and problems and content, but from a, a sense of like the information's out there, the, the trick is what do you do with it? Right? How do we process all of this information that's available? How do we approach these complicated problems that we find in the world? And so the Habits of Mind courses are about um, hoping to develop for students uh, particular ways of seeing and thinking about it and investigating the world as they find it, and not just about content delivery. We'll get more into that as we go along. Finally, the integrated courses. Uh, so we've got our diversity and equity uh, requirement. Um, that's a really great section of this, and we find that uh, that too, like Habits of Mind, is offered across the entirety of our curriculum from 100 to 400 level. And we've uh, pushed this and emphasized it in such a way that we hope students, um, A, 
encounter it kind of naturally in their course of study, ideally within their major, but also uh, multiple times, right? In our ideal world, they would uh, take a div course, maybe not even without thinking about it, a couple, two, three times over their, their time here at AU. We've got uh, the quantitative literacy two and written communication two. Um, and these you might think of as quantitative reasoning and writing within your discipline. These courses ideally would happen within the major um, as a structured and regular part of the major. And so that students can then take those foundation things that they learned in their first year, like, okay, what's it mean to write an essay? To now, like, what does it mean to write as a journalist? What does it mean to write as a biologist? What does it mean to write as a finance major? Um, so that they can really uh, practice those specific skills in their area of study. Same too with quantitative reasoning. Uh, all disciplines uh, need to deal with this kind of thinking, right? But it would be really different what, quantita what quantitative thinking looks like for a philosopher versus a social scientist versus a natural scientist versus an art student. So again, ideally, uh, students will encounter this course within the, uh, within the progress of their major, um, and get to think about the specific details of, of that skill uh, within their area of study. And then finally, the capstone, which ideally gives students the chance to bring together all of this that they've encountered uh, in the core curriculum, but also in their major, into a final meaningful project at the end of the, at the, end of the time period. So then let's turn now to the elements of a proposal. And there are two kinds of proposals. We'll talk first about what the different parts are, and then we're going to go into more depth specifically about the proposals that are used for our habits of mind and our integrated requirements. So this first uh, slide here reflects the elements of a proposal for habits of mind and integrated requirements. Um, the details of this will become more clear as we get into showing you examples, but want to uh, highlight first just what those different pieces are and why those pieces are a part of this process. So we have a learning outcomes worksheet. This is really the, the starting point for your thinking about a course. Um, and it's, it's really the uh, object that the committees, the faculty committees use to help their guide their reading of a course and understanding how it's intentionally crafted in a way that is meant to uh, provide students with opportunities to demonstrate their learning and to build that habit or those ways of thinking. Uh, there are a set of limited supporting documents that we request. These are primarily going to be the kinds of materials that you are already designing in order to teach that class. So the, the committee is interested in seeing examples of assignments, for example, uh, for instance. There's a course information sheet. That's going to be your basic information about what is this course? <laughs> what is the number? What's the name? Uh, which helps us to then facilitate some of the like paperwork that goes along with uh, getting it into the system and so forth. And then a syllabus. And that rounds out the process. What we have been very intentional about is designing a proposal that uh, is centered on the materials you would need to deliver the course ultimately, whether it's you or another faculty member who's picking that course up from you. Uh, this, I think, is, is one of the ways in which we're uh, trying to bridge both the bureaucratic needs of a process and also the practical means of, of designing and delivering a course. We don't want to add more than we really need to in order to evaluate this. And because this is a student-centered curriculum, we hope that the ways that we're looking for evidence that a course is meeting that, uh, those particular requirements for becoming a core class are present in those documents that are being used to, to teach and design that course. And then, uh, as a kind of anchor for us, uh, we have two deadlines each year, those that are typically the third Wednesday of the fall and spring semester. So as you start to think about when you're angling to, to submit a proposal, we've got one coming up here on September 11th, uh, but we'll have uh, another in, depending on how the calendar falls, either end of January or beginning of February. Um, and sort of able to move on that, that timeline each year. 
you want to talk a little bit about complex problems? Sure. And we'll talk about why that proposal process is a little different. Yeah, exactly. So um, back to complex problems, which is that first year seminar. Um, we run a lot of sections of uh, complex problems uh, every year, right? Because we need to have uh, small courses for all of our incoming students, right? So we've got uh, on the books currently something like 130 different seminar topics. Um, and they're all taught by full-time faculty, which is another kind of key part of the uh, of the program there. And the hope is, you know, these courses, um, because they are designed to be multi and interdisciplinary, right? With this idea that uh, the problems addressed in these courses can't be solved by a singular, singular disciplinary approach. Nevertheless, the students are going to get to encounter you as a faculty member, um, thinking through these fascinating ideas uh, with the hope that maybe they'll then uh, pick up another course from you uh, later on in the semester. So they're both a great opportunity to break down some of our disciplinary silos while also introduce students to you as a thinker uh, and a scholar. All Complex Problems courses also come with a, uh, a peer leader, uh, which is a, a upper graduate, uh, or, you know, a second year or beyond student uh, who assists in the classroom and can uh, provide a variety of support mechanisms for you as the instructor and for the students. They're not TAs, they don't do grading, um, but it is a way to do sort of different kinds of, for example, active learning. I have my peer leaders uh, take my students to various sites across the district uh, to help engage in the material uh, beyond just our classroom setting. Uh, and that is, points directly to those co-curricular experiences, which are these opportunities for engagement uh, beyond just the twice a week or whatever uh, encounters in, uh, in the classroom. Um, I think in a lot of ways, complex problems sets the stage for students about what it means to think uh, at a university, what it means to think academically, what it means to engage intellectually with the world around them. And so uh, this has been a really big success of, our, uh, of the core program so far. And if you've got, I, I think too, for faculty, this is an opportunity to um, maybe propose that class that doesn't quite fit within your department, right? That would be a little bit of an oddball because it isn't so disciplinarily uh, specific or rigid. Um, it's like, oh, wait, there's a place to do that than to celebrate the complexity of, of the phenomenon, right? So if you've got, got a class like that where you're like, boy, I'd love to teach this, but it doesn't fit within our, uh, my department's curriculum, complex problem would be the perfect place for that to sort of uh, blossom and really serve our students in lots of uh, diverse ways. So complex problem seminars uniquely are um, specific to an individual faculty member. So they are the work that Martin is interested in doing, that Diamond or Sarah are interested in doing. Contrast that with courses proposed for habits of mind or the integrative requirements, which are courses in your unit proposed initially through your unit and then have the subject code for your, your field or discipline. So whether that's comm or government or uh, performing arts, Complex problems are associated with an individual faculty member. So you can see here just a, a, a very narrow range of those 130 topics to get a sense of how uh, diverse uh, those entry points are into those topics. Uh, the proposal also looks a little bit different. Uh, here for complex problems, it doesn't include a full syllabus. Uh, and I think this is reflective of the uh, collaborative way in which those courses are uh, ultimately delivered. Uh, so the complex problem subcommittee is interested in understanding what is the complex problem or enduring question that you are interested in unpacking with students and working through and, and showing how it can't be solved readily by one field or discipline or methodological approach. Um, and, and why is that appropriate for first year students? Uh, and then do you have enough of a, a sense of what this can be that then once approved, the committee can work with you further, the team can work with you further and support your work to fully design that class, recognizing that often when you're working with first year students, you're maybe only a step or two ahead of them in these seminars because you're able to adapt and incorporate where those students are, what those interests that they're bringing to your seminar are, and sort of design on the fly in a, in a, in a way. Martin has taught his complex problems for several semesters, and so his has more of a, a sort of uh, sense of constancy. 
Um, but I think initially you certainly were kind of. Yeah, it's uh, uh, so um, uh, I teach a class Jerusalem myth, history, and modernity. Um, had never taught a course on Jerusalem per se before, right? Like to get to like focus on a, a specific city was sort of a new thing for me, right? So it was very much a new place moving into that. I got a chance obviously to develop and be like, okay, this is the approach I'm gonna take. And then of course last fall threw everything uh, for a loop for all of us, right? And we had to adjust on the fly. And um, that, that course uh, will continue to sort of evolve um, related to the world and you can't sort of ignore on the world as we find it in these courses, right? So that's part of the hope of these is that these are things that are uh, immediately meaningful for students and they can see, oh yeah, thinking through this, there's no like simple answer to it, right? We've got to um, constantly adjust, re-engage, ask ourselves questions again, and be willing to reconsider. And faculty are asked to make for complex problems uh, a three years or three time commitment. And part of that motivation was with this idea that if uh, Martin proposed a topic that no longer felt current and at the moment, no longer relevant, he could retire that topic and introduce something new. Um, and so it kind of keeps that complex problems curriculum fresh and, and uh, sort of really uh, exciting for students as they start their, their time at American University. We're not gonna focus too much on complex problems today. Um, instead, we're going to talk about the habits of mind and integrative course proposal process um, and how you can uh, start to conceptualize an approach, thinking about a concept for either of those broad areas. Um, and we'll take you a little bit more in depth into a, one of the aspects of the proposal, show you a couple of assignments that give you a sense of how to think about what it means to foreground inquiry rather than content. Um, and then before we go, what we'll do is we'll actually pull up our website and show you directly where you can find those course proposal materials, um, because uh, all of those categories of things. So like when I talk about complex problems and cover sheet rationale learning outcomes, we have a lot more guidance on our website um, in the actual forms that a, that a person would fill out. And we have resources um, and examples that you can also access um, in our materials. All right, so here I, I might take one second to pause and see uh, is there are there questions from our audience or yeah. Yeah, so I've, I've looked into uh, your fortune curriculum before and started proposals. I also have a hard time figuring out the difference between the complex problem and the habit of, habits of mind because they both focus on inquiry and having students reflect. So is it the level of depth that you go into uh, that differs in complex problems with um, the habits of mind or the amount of, of reading that students are expected to do first year versus you know, yeah. second yeah. or third year? Or okay, great question. So there's a couple parts to that. One, right, complex problems is all is designed it's, um, primarily for first year like incoming right. students, right? And so the pitch there is gonna be like, how do we take this like immensely uh, complicated thing and find a way to engage our students on thinking through it in a way that's appropriate for first year students, right? And so there's, there's certainly that kind of uh, appropriate leveling that happens there. I think the other big difference, and so the habits of mind courses can happen uh, throughout the curriculum from 100 level to a 400 level. And so the, the decision that you make there is like, okay, where in my unit or in my department's curriculum does this class fit? Okay, is there a 100 level class that I'm pitching or a 300 level class, right? And so the leveling there is more conversation with your department than with uh, core per se, right? Because we are open, we're ambivalent uh, as to uh, at what level you would pitch a habits of mind course, right? Whereas all complex problems courses are in many ways designed for incoming students. But technically a topic could fit in both categories, just the level of work and depth in thinking that would be tailored to the different either the habits of mind or the accomplished problems. I think the question sets up actually the first uh, bullet, uh, the sort of first item on this slide, of uh, what is the dominant habit that students will practice in the course? So as you look at the learning outcomes that are associated with complex problems versus creative aesthetic inquiry, cultural inquiry, and the other habits of mind, um, a topic could hypothetically fit into multiple 
uh, habits. It's the, the decision that you'll need to work through is which is the dominant habit that you want to focus on uh, as the uh, sort of thread that runs through the full course. So always returning to those learning outcomes to make that determination. We have some departments who have been very um, uh, sort of savvy about navigating their curricula and seeing how their fields and disciplines can engage with these habits uh, in different ways. For example, um, art history always comes to mind to me because they have taken a look at some of their um, uh, old general education classes and redesigned these and, and thought about how art history has something to say about creative aesthetic inquiry and cultural inquiry and socio-historical inquiry. And you could well imagine any one of those courses could have been slotted into a different habit of mind, but because the content is used in service of, as a vehicle for those learning outcomes, uh, the decision really rested on where did they want to uh, spend their effort in, in practicing those habits with students. I can give a specific example yeah. from one of my courses, right? I, I, did, I, I was interested in teaching a course on the ancient Near East. Right, so we're talking like ancient Mesopotamia, uh, uh, ancient uh, ancient Iran, right? Ancient uh, uh, ancient Egypt, and I sort of was wondering about. I was like, what do I want to do with this class, right? Because this could be a socio-historical class, thinking about right how we navigate this. It also be a kind of like peculiar sort of cultural inquiry class, right? What what is like the idea of the Near East? Like where does that come from? How does it develop? Where are the peoples that are involved? Right? But what I decided to focus on was the religion and ethics of the ancient Near East, right? And so I really terrible this. So we're not doing tons of archaeology in this course. Instead we're trying to excavate the texts from this place and think about how did peoples in the ancient world navigate ethical questions? What kinds of questions were they asking? What kind of solutions did they propose? And how did that shape their societies, right? And so it became an ethics course when it could very well have been some other kind of course, right? But that was the, 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 that's the sort of like decision that you as a faculty member needs to make early on. Like, um, what way of thinking do I want to emphasize here? Because the content is just the vehicle for that, that habit of mind, for that inquiry question, right? And this gets back right to this right at the start. I mentioned it a little bit, and, and, I, and I think it um, behooves us to return to it again and again. In many ways, the core is content neutral. Like you can teach a course within the core on anything of your choosing, right? Anything that works for you personally and for your department. The choice we've got to make, and the thing that we really care about is like, how are you going to investigate that content? How are you going to ask questions about it? What is going to be the uh, the uh, methodology or way of thinking into that content. And that's what we really want to provide the students, right? Because the content is out there, right? We all know that there's all this information out there. But it gets back to that question of like, so what do we do with it, right? And so the habits of mind specifically are the, the uh, opportunity to illustrate, here's a batch of content, what do we do with it? Well, here's what a social scientist might think, of, think about it, right? But was, uh, as we know, um, social science is also always engaged uh, in questions of history and time and space, right? And so how do we put these things together in order to unlock that content in, in new and particular sorts of ways? Does that help um, a little bit yeah. with that? Yeah. Were there any questions online? Uh, I think uh, Brad partly answered this in talking about the learning outcomes. Okay, yeah. Uh, Kelly had asked about what the difference between a hundred level HOM versus CP was, but I think the the sort of learning outcomes as the focus answer that question. And, and I guess we'll also say right the complex problem. Hmm, let me draw back the curtain just a, a smidge here before we go on. Brad's reference a couple times the subcommittees for core. We've got a subcommittee for each element of the core. Okay, so there's one for complex problems. There's one for uh, writing information literacy, there's one for each of the habits of mind, there's one for the div requirement, and those subcommittees, right, when you submit your proposal, it's not to the four of us, right? We help shepherd it through, but we are not evaluating those proposals. Instead, that evaluation is being done by your colleagues who staff those subcommittees, and the call, every college has been invited to contribute a, a member to those committees, more or less, um, and so the your proposal is being read by 
uh, experts in the area who come from across the university who are going to sit down. Now, they might not be experts in your particular discipline, but they have been teaching within that area of the core or have been thinking through the, the methodological questions that are raised by those, uh, those areas in the core, and they are the ones who are doing the evaluation of the proposal, just so that's clear, right? So it's your colleagues uh, uh, who are thinking, how, how will this work within the core? Um, the, so when you're writing the proposal, that's the sort of initial audience, right? That they are, of course, thinking about the students uh, in, in the whole time. Um, the other, the other part of this is that you got to work with your department, of course, right? Uh, make sure that, of course, uh, if it's a habit of mind, that it's going to fit within the uh, needs of the, of the major in which you teach, right? And that you work with your uh, your chair in that regard, right? Complex problems, because it doesn't count towards any major is a little bit more independent. You still need to talk to your chair, of course, um, but uh, it doesn't need to fit into the curricular arc of any particular major. It's just for the core. But okay. um, So we've talked a little bit about this, like really asking that question, what is that habit of mind? What is that way of thinking? What is that mode of inquiry that you want to emphasize in your course. And, and again, the content is sort of neutral, at least from the community's point of view. It's more about that way of thinking that you're going to emphasize, which will also ultimately determine where in the core you would put a proposal. Um, the, the next step of, of that is like, OK, you've got this like uh, mode of thinking. Um, how are the students going to do that? Right? How are you going to give the students an opportunity to illustrate their uh, negotiation with that. And so this is the learning transfer question, and we'll show how that uh, shows up in the proposal document in uh, just, just a minute. Um, uh, that's, or that's both part of the, the syllabus and then in the assignments, which is the third point here. Uh, what do the students produce to demonstrate uh, that activity? And I think that sets us up nicely then to, to talk about one of those elements of the proposal. So we emphasize the student work. We emphasize that the students are actively engaged in their learning. Um, and so we want to talk a little bit about that centerpiece of the course proposal uh, forms, the learning outcomes worksheet. And here um, I've pasted in uh, the uh, worksheet for our diversity and equity requirement. Yeah, so thinking about our learning outcomes, um, that's the sort of framework in which you start to build your courses, right? They, as Brad was saying, um, that's how you sort of set it up, that's how you frame it. And then when you're talking about uh, building this uh, assignment or building it so that you can present it to the committee, um, you're thinking about the learning outcomes and how they work in terms of like how you build your assignments, how you think about um, the, the work in which you may do in the class, like that week to week, day to day sort of thing. Um, and so while we're not expecting you to necessarily build everything with the specific learning outcome in mind, you do want to think about how you're, how you're planning to assess students or how, what are the things that you want them to learn? And then using that as the framework to sort of build your assignments. Um, what is it the thing that you want them to walk away with? And then here are the steps that will build up to getting there. And then with our learning outcomes, we try to build them in a way that uh, each learning outcome sort of builds on the previous one. So all of it's about scaffolding and building up to the, the habit itself. And so everything is reinforcing the habits themselves and what are the little things that lead up to the much larger thing and then building up from uh, the the first learning outcome to the second learning outcome to the third learning outcome. And you can see here on this worksheet, and we'll, maybe if we've got time, we'll give an example of what this looks like. But um, uh, the question, the, the way that we think about this, and I know when I like first did this, I was like, what am I doing, right? Because I never designed a class this way, right? This is not how I would right before. It's like, well, I've got an idea, and like, here you go. Um, but, but I think what this does, and I, I've really come to embrace this, this schema, right, is to say, okay, I want students to do, the, and here is the example number one, um, for the diversity and equity uh, uh, part of the core, describe patterns of thought or practices of historically marginalized people. Okay, that's the, one of the things that we need to do in this class is describe these, habit, uh, these, these um, patterns of thought. Okay, how am I going to do that in the class? Like, where is that showing up in our conversations, in our readings, in the curriculum itself, right? Like, what is happening there? And that's that first column. It's like, where is this occurring? 
within our teaching, within the materials that are assigned, within our day-to-day -day conversations. And then the second part of that is like, and when do the students get to do that? Where is their, op their opportunity for engaging with that stuff? That's the second part. So I think there's a real um, value in attending to these questions as you structure the course and say, okay, where does it show up in my syllabus? Where is it going to show up in our day-to-day -day conversations? And where do the students get a chance to illustrate that they too are engaging uh, with this intention in an, in an intentional way, excuse me. And if you had an opportunity to participate in that course design uh, institute or workshop, uh, you may have been introduced to the idea of course mapping. This is a simplified version of a course map. So we're not asking you to, to provide a ton of detail, but to outline uh, with some detail the ways in which that engagement is occurring, both in the day-to-day the -day and in the ways that students are going to practice that, that habit that, that we're trying to develop and reflect on it, too, because I will say that the metacognitive piece is an important way in which students move from practicing that habit in the context of your specific course to other settings in the real world, to other courses in, in, in addition to that. Um, I forget, this may be the part, yeah, okay. So here's one kind of example, right? and this is from the course that I had proposed for the, the div requirement. Um, and uh, what we want to show here is the way in which the learning outcomes can really shape the, uh, the student work products uh, in valuable ways, right? When I first designed the course, this was sort of the example, of, this is an example of what I imagined was going to be the final assignment. And it looked like the final assignment in lots of other courses that I taught, right? Where I'm like, okay, the class is about like, what does it mean to be Muslim in America, right? And the, the highlighted portion at the end is like the final, the scope of your final project is this outlined in conversation with me, but like do a thing, right? It was really loosey goosey. And, and you know, students like gave me stuff for <laughs> final projects. And sometimes it was great. And sometimes I was like, oh, like, what is this, right? Like, where did this, what, this doesn't seem to like be maybe connected to our class very much. Or like, did they miss that part of the course? Why is this not showing up here? And I, I realized that, that my, um, the, my the loosey goosiness of my instructions uh, wasn't giving students the chance to like go back to what we had done for months together and be like, ah, okay, how am I going to get to practice these things that we've been discussing all semester long? And how am I going to get to illustrate them? And how am I going to get to really dig in on them, right? So as I attended more and more closely to those learning outcomes in the next slide, right? Um, here's the, the sort of uh, current version of that final assignment. And I'll just look at the orange section. The project uh, must, however, indicate the historical and social context of Islam in America by an appreciation of the structural and institutional challenges, right? And there it is, right? It's those questions of like structural institutions and uh, religious identity and how are they playing out here particularly in America, right? And so by uh, attending more closely to those learning outcomes, I was able to write a much clearer uh, final project prompt. And the, the work that I'm getting back from students is so much better, much more sophisticated, much more engaged with both the material from our class, but also then giving them opportunity to be like, oh, and here it is also showing up in these other contexts or in these other areas or in these other sort of like moments in time or in communities, right? And it has been a sort of revelatory for me in seeing how um, thinking thoughtfully about those learning outcomes can be a real benefit, both for me as the person who has to like grade these things at the end of the semester, but also for the students to be like, oh, I get what he's asking for, I get how this connects to the class, and I get how I can uh, apply it myself in, in an area that I'm interested in. So um, I, I want to become a kind of evangelist for thinking through learning outcomes here. Sorts of ways. And I'll take that even one step further to say, and it helps us to see uh, as a as a uh, faculty committee um, how across courses students are performing against these learning outcomes. Where what kinds of assignments best set them up to achieve those learning outcomes? Like where the good match is, like how to do it well. Um, we have excellent colleagues who are approaching these learning outcomes in individual and uh, creative ways. And so surfacing that work and looking at it across courses allows us to then uh, share that information back to better those courses 
and to create uh, a more successful learning environment for our students. So that thread that we run all the way through from the course proposal um, to then subsequently assessment creates that through line through which we can uh, really develop and sort of like achieve the like uh, the learning experience that we're promising to students. Um, so I know that we are quickly running out of time. What I want to shift us to next is actually stepping back from the proposal process, show you where you can find the information, which will take just a moment, and then would love to hear sort of like what are the questions on your mind that you're left with as we sort of pause? Yeah, more happy to give like super mini workshops or anything that you've got on your mind. Right? Um, so be thinking about those questions as I shift which screen I'm showing you. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do is show you So if you Google AU Core American University, you'll be led to our website. In the faculty and staff resources, you will find a link to the AU Core faculty and staff SharePoint. This will take you to SharePoint. You may be asked to log in with your AU credentials. Not That's not the screen? OK. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> oh, fun. Let's go. Okay. Uh, thank you for catching that. Um, how about now? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Okay. So, our AU Core faculty and staff SharePoint. Uh, you'll see a banner that says call for proposals, click for more information. You can also see a button that says propose a course. Either link will take you to the same page where you will then be able to access all of our proposal instructions, the forms for each requirement, as well as supporting materials. Um, in addition to that, I'll also highlight that we do make available all of the approved proposals. So you can look at everything that's been approved in the past. Anything else, Sarah, that you want to highlight about that information? Um, I didn't see. Okay. Why don't we click on one of them just so you can see what pops up if you're going for creative aesthetic, right? So here you'll see the uh, learning outcomes worksheet, right, which we had just shown uh, earlier. And you can take this and download it and fill it out, right, um, as part of your process. Here's the section for the supporting documents that we referenced earlier. Um, you can describe assignments that you're going to, that you're sort of thinking about for the course, or you can attach uh, assignments if you've got them in a, a different document. Um, and this is a chance also for some kind of like prosaic description of how you're imagining this course to work, right? So the organization of it, the learning transfer, what's your um, sort of uh, your own personal mechanism for, for going after the, uh, going after the, the uh, particular section of the core. Um, some of this is a little bit bureaucratic, right? This course information sheet is uh, is that, right? And that's just be like, okay, when uh, once the course gets approved, what do we need to sign up for the registrar? Um, as well as making sure that we've looped in your uh, your department chair and whatnot. Um, but the, those last few pages are pretty simple, right? It's that workshop that is, or the sorry, the worksheet that is really the critical part. Um, and, and where you just spend your time in the development of that idea um, for your colleagues. And what Martin said there at the end is key too, that all of this work starts with your department chair or program director. Um, you should always be working in conjunction with them, whether that's for complex problems or other parts of the core, uh, because the core doesn't have faculty. Uh, we work in conjunction with every unit on campus and so we're always balancing uh, the needs of the departments with the needs of this general education program of the core curriculum, working with your associate deans to make sure that we're able to, to provide the courses and sections that are needed for students to graduate um, in the timely way. So if at any point you've got kind of questions about this or sort of puzzling through, any of us on the team are happy to um... Uh, respond right to, to questions that you might have. We also listed on the, the previous page 
Um, there are the chairs for all the subcommittees in the core. And oftentimes you're like, hey, I'm thinking about doing an ethical reasoning class. We'll be like, that's great. Sounds cool. Let's put you in touch with Lauren Weiss from Philosophy and Religion, who's the current uh, chair of the uh, ethical reasoning subcommittee. And she'll be eager to sort of talk through the idea and give you sort of pointers as a part of the process, right? So we hope to make this as collaborative a uh, uh, process as possible. Yeah. So one of the questions in the chat is, is the learning transfer section new? I don't see it included in some of the proposals. It is not new. So that is an interesting observation that it's not there. In some of the like previous proposals in the like approved sections or in the documents. Sorry, we'd have to double check that. Interesting. All right. Previous approved. Um, so the, the proposal forms have evolved uh, some over the years. They've been stable, I would say, for the last four or five years. Um, but certainly the, the very first proposals uh, were a learning process for us as, as, a, as a community. And, there were a couple of different kinds of worksheets as yeah. well, right? There was one. There was a Mad Libs version. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so maybe in some of the earlier proposals that explicit language about learning transfer might not have been there, but if you've got questions about it, of course, mm -hmm. we're happy to, to help you think through those. And I think you'll also see in those proposals, especially earlier ones in the worksheet, uh, where the assignments, for example, uh, it might say discussion uh, questions or um, essays. The committee will really be looking for more than that. They're going to be looking for it's this particular um, essay that is about this topic. Um, uh, and particularly when students have agency about the direction that an assignment will go, they're going to be interested in how are you ensuring that no matter what choice of topic a student is making, that that learning outcome will still be hit. So that um, if, for example, um, let's say this was creative aesthetic inquiry, um, that a student might uh, still touch on the sort of formal and structural components of, of an artistic work, even if they're attending to more of the um, contextual parts of an art, artwork's uh, sort of genesis. We could say a lot more about that, but in the interest yeah. of time, happy to field other questions or inquiries or people wanting to say, hey, I'm thinking about this, right? We could um, talk about that. I'll also mention that we're hosting another workshop next week. Um, for those, it's more geared towards those who have a proposal in progress uh, who are thinking about that September 11 deadline. Um, so that will be much more of a like bring your draft and let's let's work through questions that you have. Um, but again, could see that as useful for somebody who is earlier on in the process and wants to observe that conversation with others. I think the other the final thing to say about this is a little bit of our timeline in the process of it, right? Um, our subcommittees will start uh, meeting right around that uh, deadline in early September. Um, It'll take them a couple of weeks to sort of read through the material, um, and they can respond. There's a couple of different responses that you can get from a proposal. One uh, is like approval, which is great. Like, looks wonderful. Let's get it on the books and make it happen. Um, uh, committees might think that uh, it looks like really close, but they've got some questions, and so they might ask for some what we call clarification about uh, parts of the proposal. If uh, they might determine that, of course, like. Uh, is getting there, but not quite yet. And so they'll ask for a minor revision, or if it seems to be just sort of a mismatch, um, there's a major revision there where it's like, we think we need to like really kind of return to thinking about this again. But those are the kinds of responses you can get from the committee. Um, we're happy to have sort of back and forth uh, as appropriate with that. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, in the speediest sense, we can get a, we can receive a proposal get it approved and have it uh, ready to go within just a few months, right? Um, but of course, that process can take longer, so uh, depending on the class. Typically, I would say if you propose a course, uh, say in the fall, um, there are high high chances that you can then find a be teaching for the fall, fall right? It could be a 
typical time for the course. So can you post a link to next week's workshop? Yep, work it awesome. I'm gonna other kinds of questions. Is there a way to filter or sort the previous proposals by date approved? All the ones I, I'm looking at don't have the learning outcomes, or oh, sorry, the learning transfer section, and I'm looking for guidance and examples of it. Um, let's see. Actually, uh, there is not currently a way to do that, um, but we can definitely add that. Uh, as soon as we go back to our offices. And uh, maybe, so you have to maybe drop us a note and we can help make sure to connect you yeah. to proposals that have that learning transfer, right? Yeah. We, we can find that for you. Okay, so yeah. don't don't spend any more time digging around. Drop us a note um, and uh, we'll make sure we can produce that for you. Or give guidance as, as, as necessary. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us.